hello everyone. My name is uh, Bill Middleton. I'd like to thank the uh, program committee for inviting me to give this talk at the plenary session. Um, I'm not sure I'd like to thank them quite as much for giving me the title of ACR Tyrant beyond the chart, um, but I hope that I'll be able to do that topic justice um, and that they won't uh, regret this decision to invite me. These are my uh, educational objectives. I have no financial disclosures. Um, and these are the subjects that I'll cover, starting with the fine print that actually appears on the chart, but probably deserves a bit more attention than it uh, usually gets. So I particularly want to talk about the boxes at the bottom, um, which discuss aspects of the five different feature categories that can come in handy at times. For instance, uh, with composition, you see that spongiform nodules require at least 50% of the nodule to be spongy. And also when the composition can't be determined, you assign two points. You assign one point when echogenicity can't be determined. Shape, uh, whether it's taller than wide or wider than tall, can usually be determined on visual inspection. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Extrathyroidal extension should only be diagnosed when it's obvious um, and unequivocal, and I'll talk about that more later on as well. And then large comet tail artifacts need to be greater than one millimeter to qualify. And realize that one millimeter may be longer than you think. You may need to measure it a few times to get a feel for what one millimeter really is. Now, did you know that there's a second chart? You can find it on the ACR website it combines a pattern-based approach with the point-based approach and was designed to make it easier for radiologists who are more comfortable with the pattern approach. It starts with nodule composition, just like we see up at the top. Then it adds in echogenicity and shows the accumulated points based on those two features. Next, it groups margins, shape, and echogenic foci together and eliminates features with zero points. Um, such as smooth or ill-defined margins. After adding all the relevant points, the recommendations are shown based on the total points and the nodule size, just like always. Next, there's a lot of valuable, valuable information in the Tyrant manuscript that doesn't appear on the chart. I'll just mention some of the highlights. Um, nodules can be measured in many ways, but TIRADS describes one specific approach. First, you determine the orientation of the nodule in the axial plane and take two measurements. The first measurement is the maximal dimension in the long axis of the nodule. And then the second is the maximum dimension perpendicular to the first. These um, qualify as your transverse and your AP measurements. Repeat that process in the longitudinal plane but only measure the maximum dimension. And this qualifies as your craniocaudal uh, dimension. Now this seems simple, but many outside scans that I see submitted for reference or consultation at my own institution use tie rads, but for some reason they don't follow this approach for measurements. Does everyone realize that the committee recommends biopsying a maximum of two nodules? And if three or more fall within the ACR tie rads guidelines for biopsy, the two with the most suspicious appearance on the basis of point totals should be biopsy, even if they're not the largest. So for a case like this, there's four nodules that qualify for FNA here. These two with the highest point totals would actually be the two that you decide to target. And these two would be converted from FNA to follow-up because of their lower point total. What about follow-up? Well, all the nodules that require follow-up are followed for five years, but the number of follow-up exams varies depending on the risk level. So TR5 nodules are followed five times once every year. TR4 nodules skip the year four follow-up, so they get four exams. TR3 nodules skip the two-year and the four-year follow-up, so they only get three exams. With respect to margins, I mentioned earlier that I would circle back to extrathyroidal extension. Uh, the paper states that extensive ETE 
characterized by frank invasion of adjacent soft tissues or vascular structures is a highly reliable sign of malignancy. Minimal ETE may be suspected sonographically in the presence of border abutment, contour bulging, or loss of the echogenic thyroid border. Now, what this translates into is that you should only score ETE when it's obvious and unequivocal. Marginal abutment and bulging contours may increase the chance of minimal uh, ETE, but they don't guarantee it. So this is a case that shows extension of the nodule beyond the margin with marked distortion of this deep strap muscle. And uh, strap muscle invasion was in fact uh, confirmed um, operatively. This case shows clear extension into the fat superficial to the uh, nodule. And this was confirmed as minimal ETE histologically. Now, on the other hand, this last case shows bulging of the anterior margin of the thyroid, but no obvious uh, and unequivocal ETE on ultrasound, and none was found histologically. Sherry Teefee, one of the um, co-authors, reminded the committee that nodules in critical submarginal locations may complicate surgery. Therefore, the report should also indicate whether the nodule abuts the trachea or whether it is adjacent to the tracheoesophageal group, which is the location of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. So for instance, this is a 1.2 centimeter TR4 nodule that would normally be followed. But this location down deep in the posterior aspect of the um, thyroid is immediately adjacent to the recurrent laryngeal nerve as shown in the diagram here. So the surgeon may actually prefer to do an FNA, and if it is cancer, resect it before it has a chance to grow and possibly even invade the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. Another manuscript designed to help with implementation and use of the TIRADS is the user's guide. When it comes to shape, the user's guide states, we also know that nodules that are perfectly round in cross-section are technically neither wider than tall nor taller than wide. When that occurs, it is acceptable to report the, nod to report the nodule as either wider than tall or not taller than wide. Either way, it gets zero points rather than three points. Uh, the user's guide also states that a gestalt impression of whether a nodule is taller than wide is usually sufficient. The goal is to ascertain whether the nodule has grown more front to back than side to side, which suggests that it's violated tissue planes and is therefore suspicious. My personal belief is that a visual inspection is not only sufficient, but is often preferable to a strict reliance on measurements, you know, for a concept that's inherently uh, nuanced like nodule shape is. This is an example of a nodule that looks taller than wide on the left image and wider than tall on the right image. Now, why does that happen? Um, it's because the apparent orientation of the nodule depends on the location of the transducer. So when the transducer is in a lateral position like this, the nodule will appear taller than wide, as shown here. On the other hand, when the transducer in is, is in a more anterior position, as we see here, the nodule will actually appear wider than tall, um, as this uh, shows. With respect to nodes, the guide states that at least a brief assessment of nodes uh, may be helpful in determining the need for FNA in the setting of a thyroid uh, nodule. Um, if the node is very suspicious, then that may change the way you approach a particular nodule. But it states that a comprehensive evaluation of nodes is required in patients known to have or suspected of having thyroid cancer. That assessment may be performed at the time of the initial thyroid ultrasound exam in conjunction with an FNA or as a separate preoperative ultrasound evaluation after a cancer diagnosis has been made with FNA. At my institution, we follow the latter approach because we don't want to spend the extra time needed to do a 
thorough comprehensive evaluation of nodes on the first examination when none of the nodules may be cancer to begin with. Um, there are nine lectures available on the ACR website that answer questions submitted by users um, and address many other issues uh, that, that you might uh, encounter. Now, there's not enough time to cover all of these uh, things, but I would recommend that you listen to these webinars if you have uh, questions. So for instance, one lecture includes a discussion of exceptions to our usual recommendations. Um, now these include nodules that are FDG avid, nodules found when doing pre-op exams for other uh, reasons, uh, nodules in critical locations as we just previously mentioned, and a variety of other situations. So for instance, this is a patient with hyperparathyroidism who has a parathyroid adenoma um, shown here, but it also has a seven millimeter TR5 nodule um, located here in the isthmus that would usually be followed. But the surgeon's going to be right there when he's in the OR. Um, so it just makes sense to do a pre-op FNA. And then if the nodule is positive, to do the thyroid surgery at the same time as the parathyroid uh, surgery. So this is one of the exceptions. Um, with respect to nodule composition, the user's guide indicates that a nodule must be 95% solid to be classified as solid or predominantly solid. If there is a greater than 5% a greater than 5 cystic component, it should be classified as mixed solid and cystic. So these images here on the right show a nodule that has a single prominent cystic component that on these images involves greater than 5% of the area on these two images. But composition is based on the entire volume. So you need to integrate all of the slices through the nodule. Um, and in this particular case, when the volumes were calculated for the nodule and the cyst, this turned out to be almost exactly 5% cystic uh, composition. So would just barely uh, qualify as predominantly uh, or, or entirely solid. Um, now I wanna just talk about some new emerging uh, data. There's a number of papers that have reevaluated the five uh, TIRADS features and some that have even, even suggested uh, new features. Uh, one of the new features uh, is uh, location. Um, so this study of more than 3000 nodules found that location uh, was an independent risk factor for thyroid malignancy. Um, the highest risk location was the isthmus uh, with an odds ratio of 2.4 when compared to the lower pole, which had the lowest uh, risk of uh, malignancy. And then finally, there are some other emerging techniques um, that are being explored all the time. I can't discuss all of them, but one that I think is particularly exciting is uh, artificial uh, intelligence. So here's a platform that's been developed. Um, this is an example of a thyroid nodule with the regions of interest shown. I hit analyze for the um, algorithm to start to do its calculations. It's thinking and it shows the five different uh, TIRADS features. So composition is mixed solid and cystic echogenicity, hypochoic, shape taller than wide, margin smooth, and large comet tail artifacts. This one, I'm not quite so sure about. I'm gonna check to see the confidence that the algorithm had. This blue box shows that, um, and it's fairly confident. So I'm gonna leave that alone. So this is a TR3 nodule that we did a recommendation for um, FNA. Now, if I apply the um, AI calculator, it's, thinking that this is more a benign appearance. So it's subtracting one point that converts this to a TR2, which would get a recommendation for no FNA and no follow-up. Um, at this point, I'm gonna show where the nodule is located, create a summary. This would go to our PAC system, to the referring physician and to your PowerScribe uh, reporting template. Now, if you were to get information afterwards that the patient had a family history of thyroid cancer, you could eliminate the AI calculator since it has no idea about family history, and then it would convert back to a TR3 and your recommendation would be FNA. This particular system has been tested on 
600 nodules with 15 different reviewers, all of whom uh, reviewed 600 nodules each. Um, and it was found that it improved sensitivity by 14% and specificity by 37%. Now the graph shows sensitivity on the vertical axis and specificity on the horizontal, on the horizontal axis for each of the 15 reviewers. Um, and as you can see, all but one had improvements in their operating point with respect to sensitivity, shown as the arrow moving up from bottom to, to top. And all but one had improvements in specificity shown as the area, as the arrow rather moving to the right. So in summary, uh, I hope that I've gotten across that the value of the ACR tie rads can be maximized by being familiar with material that is beyond the chart. And that includes material elsewhere in the original white paper, uh, material that's in the uh, user's guide, um, and material that's on the ACR uh, website. Um, and I would just recommend that you stay tuned for continuing emergence of new data and new techniques. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.